Hello guys, Winston here. My friends are total nerds, and I mean that in the most endearing way possible. It is, after all, probably why they're my friends. Recently, one of them inquired about commissioning a piece as an anniversary gift for her husband, and even before we knew exactly what it would be, I was on board. The way I usually steer people when the exact parameters of a project aren't fully known yet is to tell them to go find a couple ideas from places like Pinterest. Find something you like, refine your search as you go. In this case, her trail of queries led her to this wooden Pokeball. I thought this was a pretty cool idea. Certainly much cooler than a lot of the cliched gift ideas I was seeing, like plaques or pictures or other trinkets that would be trivial to make on a CNC or a laser. This would be, at the very least, fun. But this also awakened in me a long-standing grievance I've had with how people make props or replicas that go on display like this. They go through all this effort to make something beautiful, only to drill a hole in the bottom and screw, glue, or bolt it to a fixed base. You made something that looks the part and would probably feel the part, but no one will actually know. In my opinion, part of the joy of making an imaginary thing is to have that tactile experience of holding it. To permanently relegate your creation to display, especially one that's actually meant to fit in the palm of your hand, takes away some of that fun factor. So I really wanted to design this Pokeball in a way that it could be easily detached from its pedestal. For that, the solution was to use magnets that I would embed within the Pokeball and the pedestal. Going even further though, I really wanted this Pokeball to be able to open. I always felt that the plastic Pokeball toys that I played with as a wee lad were just a little disappointing. Not because they didn't imprison a real living creature, but because the mechanical design of the real-life Pokeballs had to make concessions for manufacturability and injection molding. They either snapped together like Tupperware or used ugly hinges that were visible from the outside. This was unacceptable to me. This wooden Pokeball had to open and do so in a way that would be unseen from the outside. I wasn't going to charge my friend for it because she never asked for this feature, and in fact she wouldn't know about it until after I delivered the project, but to soothe my own conscience as a maker, I had to make this Pokeball open. That self-imposed requirement led me to start researching concealed hinges, and the ones I settled on were from Sauce. These hinges were designed with some clever kinematic linkages that caused the halves to more or less pivot about a virtual axis external to the hinge. I had to buy a set first before I could design my Pokeball because I needed to know where these would sit. That distance to the imaginary axis of rotation would determine how close to the edge I could place the hinges. I know you can get barrel hinges that work similarly, but these seemed like they would give me just a little bit more separation between the two halves. This was important because of the curvature of the Pokeball in the virtual pivot point of the hinge. I'd have to place the hinges dangerously close to the edge, leaving some mighty thin features. But with a downcutting end mill and shallow step downs, I was pretty sure I could pull it off. To verify that everything would work and that I wouldn't have any clearance issues, I sucked up my pride and finally learned how to use Fusion's weird joint system. I locked the individual components of my Pokeball model together, grounded the pedestal, and created two invisible joint components about which to rotate the two halves. Using this method, I was able to ensure that I'd be able to open the Pokeball at least 90 degrees. In addition to having to design around my choice of hinge, there were a few other small design concessions I had to make here. Because of how I would be machining my Pokeball halves on a 3-axis machine in two setups, I needed to model in a uniform fillet around the button recess. Flat end mills can't cut 90 degree corners from the top. And here, where the button meets the walnut layer that would divide the Paduke and maple halves of the Pokeball, I could either put flats on the edges of that button, or come in with the Dremel to manually open up the gap in the walnut enough to permit a round button to fit inside it. I opted for the latter since I didn't want to compromise on the appearance of that bezel which would sit ever so slightly proud of the dividing layer. There are a couple more little oddities about this CAD model, but I'll explain them as they come up later. Let's get to the fun CNC stuff where I'll explain the toolpathing as I go since there are way too many individual machining setups to talk about without putting people to sleep. The first thing I machined were my Pokeball halves, since these were the parts that I was most concerned about. Op 1 for these was to machine the inside faces that would be flat. I'm starting off with a quarter inch down cutting end mill. For the bottom half of the Pokeball I had an additional toolpath to machine in a hole for a magnet. Following that up, I used an 8th inch ball and mill to define the button recess. On a desktop CNC, fluctuations in cutting forces can cause vibrations that might leave gouges in the walls. I used a 3D contour toolpath on this vertical face first to ensure that when I did my parallel toolpath, I wouldn't unexpectedly run into radial stock to leave. 
I picked a step over of about 4 thou or 0.1 millimeters. That's super tiny and makes this toolpath take a little longer, but this is a small feature and the time penalty is only about 2 minutes. That's a small price to pay to avoid having to do much sanding or manual finishing afterwards. My Pokeball would be 2.8 inches in diameter and I wanted to ensure that I would have enough stock left to be able to make a backup part if necessary. The kerf from using a quarter inch end mill to cut out my blank would leave me with uncomfortably little margin to work with on this 6 inch square turning blank that I started from. So I used an eighth inch long reach end mill to cut out my maple blank. The Paduke half of my Pokeball also came from a turning blank, though this one was of a different size. I sliced off a section of it and gingerly faced one side perfectly flat so I could ensure a strong bond to the wasteboard with double sided tape once I flipped it over. At the end of a similar set of operations, I had two pucks ready to be flipped over to machine hemispheres out of. To work hold these, I would be using a vacuum chuck I made in my previous video. These fit snugly onto the locating features I machined into the MDF. Between losses through the MDF and also some through the wood itself, I estimated that I had about 10 pounds of hold down force. Since I would be mainly using a down cutting end mill, this relatively low work holding force wouldn't be much of an issue. I used an adaptive roughing strategy to machine away the bulk of my hemispheres before finishing them with a small step over scallop toolpath. Note that I machined some extra clearance into my MDF fixture so that I could plunge my ball and mill past the bottom of my Pokeball. I also patched my model so it wouldn't do any weird moves at the front of the dome. It's just faster to let the Shaboko air cut over the button cutout instead of retracting, repositioning, and plunging again. I lightly hand sanded the domes and installed a half inch neodymium magnet in the bottom hemisphere. The hole that I bored was almost a perfect fit for the magnet. I didn't want to have to use much force to get the magnet in there and I also wanted to ensure that the CA glue I used would be able to easily surround the magnet and lock it in place. The last thing I wanted was for a magnet to be rattling around inside the Pokeball because there was no way anyone could service it once I was done. And this is where Starbond thick CA glue came in super handy. Full disclosure, Starbond reached out to me and offered to hook me up with an assortment of CA glues. And in this particular application, the thick formulation was perfect. The fine-tipped applicator delivered the adhesive exactly where I wanted it, and in one shot I was able to build up enough thickness to entomb the magnet in its pocket and guarantee that it would never come loose. To hide the magnet and make the hollow cavity inside my Pokeball usable, I cut a thin rectangle of maple to sit in the bottom of the main pocket. Since all you see is the face grain, most people won't be able to tell that it's a separate piece. I cut out the rest of my walnut and maple accents from some scraps and glued them together. Before I could integrate the front button though, I needed to knock down the corners on the back of the button. This was accomplished with some super sketchy router table shenanigans that I would rather not repeat. If I could do it all again, I would probably accept the time penalty to machine the button bezel as a two-sided operation. To fit the button to the top half of my Pokeball, I also needed to circularize the pocket for the button. I opted to do this with a Dremel and a sanding drum. I didn't have to remove a lot of material, but because of the delicate and precise nature of the operation, I didn't quite match the curvature of the button. On the left side of the walnut layer, there was a bit of a gap left between the pieces. To help fill the gap, or at least reduce the perceived depth of that crack, I once again turned to Starbon. This time, it was their medium thickness black CA glue. A couple drops of this stuff over several minutes was able to help mask that gap, though since it was darker than the walnut I was using, I didn't want to build it up flush to the surface. Now it was time for the pedestal, and for this piece I didn't have a slab of walnut thick enough to machine it in one shot. Given the material I had on hand, I decided to laminate some layers of walnut front to back. If I stacked the layers on top of each other, the seam line between pieces of walnut would still be visible and in an ugly place. By embracing the fact that this pedestal was a glue up, I think the resulting seam lines between wooden pieces would not only look deliberate, but also stylish. And by machining the pedestal in slices, I could also round over all my edges in one setup. No need to pull out the router table again. 
On the top, I added a dished recess to cradle the Pokeball. And on the bottom, I machined a half inch hole to receive more magnets. Again, I used some Starbond thick CA glue to cement my magnets in their pocket. To cover up this hole, I plugged it with another bit of walnut, and for some subtle identification, I had my logo engraved in this plug. With all the wooden pieces completed, I took my parts outside to coat. Because I wanted this piece to be durable above all else, I chose polyurethane. And here, I'm trying a new brand of spray poly. This is Varathane's triple thick formulation. I bought it because I'm impatient, and I also didn't realize that Minwax was no longer sold in Home Depot. And I have to say, if you're spraying simple geometry, this stuff would probably work great. But because of the fact that I had a lot of subtle geometries and tiny corners, I found that the thicker poly tended to build up or pool in these features. Shooting multiple thin coats would have been better in this case. I also had to apply two coats for consistency, since there were so many transition regions between face grain, edge grain, and end grain. The end grain sucked up the polyurethane much faster, so it took a second coat to become as glossy as the rest of the parts. And while I let the poly cure, I got to work on the brass placard. My initial thought was to drag engrave the text, since I had used that technique before on some commissioned award plaques. However, in the lighting of my shop, I started having second thoughts. The drag engraving looked super crisp, but just a little too faint. The engraving really needed to be deeper. So I scrapped this piece and machined another one this time using a 60 degree PCB engraver with a 5 thou ball tip. This one happens to be Carbide 3D's 501 cutter, and I engraved it to a depth of 5 thou in two passes. This time, the engraving looked way better from every angle. I gave the brass a light sanding up to 800 grit for an almost satin finish. I could have polished it to a mirror finish, but I felt that would look a little too gaudy. I gave the brass a quick coat of lacquer and then glued it to my pedestal with E6000. No CA glue this time because I wasn't sure if there would be any subtle wood movement in the walnut over time. I wanted a flexible interface between dissimilar materials. With the top and bottom halves of the Pokeball completed, it was time to mate them together. I test fit my concealed hinges and used them to locate where I needed to drill some holes. Because of the proximity of the hinge to the edge of the Pokeball, I had to be extremely careful about how deep I drilled. Looking at the 3D model, I knew I absolutely could not exceed 0.7 inches from the surface of the hinge. I taped off my drill bit and crossed my fingers. If I didn't drill these holes perfectly vertical, there was a chance that I could shoot through the outside shell of the Pokeball even if I got the depth just right. Thankfully, I was able to drill deep enough pilot holes that, when paired with shortened hardware, was able to securely hold my hinge in place and the fit was absolutely perfect. Having measured how deep I needed to recess the hinges, the faces of my Pokeball halves matched up absolutely perfectly without any visible gaps. If I needed to, I could have sanded my walnut interface a little thinner, but adding material back in to fill a gap wouldn't have been possible if the halves came to rest too far apart. And 72 hours later, this wooden Pokeball was ready for delivery. My friend who commissioned the piece for me was thrilled, her husband loved it, by all accounts, it was a great success, and I'm pretty dang proud that I got this thing together on the first try. And you know what the best feature is? Because there's a magnet in the bottom of this Pokeball, if you perturb it on a ferrous surface, it'll snap towards an upright orientation in an underdamped fashion, which is quite possibly the most confusing way I could have said that it acts like an actual Pokeball does in the cartoons and games. But of course, I am haunted by all the things I could have done better. The biggest thing I regret is not doing a better job of matching grain direction. Between the Pokeball halves and the walnut layers of the pedestal, I definitely could have paid more attention there. If I could do it again, I would also cut a slightly more generous pocket for my hinge, as it was a bit too snug for one of my hinges. Fortunately, the second hinge in the packaging was a little undersized on its outer dimensions. And lastly, I would use my CNC to drill out the screw holes for attaching the hinge. This way, I'd know the depth of that hole exactly, and I wouldn't have to worry about blowing through the outside of the Pokeball. I know a router generally isn't good for drilling since the RPM is so high, but for a limited number of holes, I think it would have worked well enough. I'll mess around with this in the future and share those results when I have them. I want to bid my good friends Steve and Bahar a happy anniversary, and I also want to thank Starbond for sending me such a versatile assortment of CA glues. I've never had the option to pick different glue formulations for different purposes, but it does feel awesome to have some choices in my arsenal for whatever adhesive needs might arise in my projects.
If you're looking to stock up on CA glue or other adhesives, take a look at Starbond's catalog. There's some good stuff there, and if you go to their site using the link in the description below and check out with promo code CNCLOVER in all caps, you'll get 10% off your order. You save money and it helps support my channel. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll be back soon with more CNC content and DIY nonsense.